All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're kind of wrapping up the series of swing bed webinars for this grant year. And so Lindsay is gonna be presenting over swing bed transitions of care. Um, as always, we're a smaller group, so please feel free if you have questions, comments, or anything you wanna share, uh, you, you have the power to unmute yourselves. Also, if you wanna put something in the chat, I'll be watching the chat as well. And with that said, Lindsay, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Laura. And it's so crazy that this, I feel like this year has just gone flown right by. So um, as Laura mentioned, this is the last uh, webinar in the swing bed series for this grant funding period. Um, and so uh, just thank you for letting me, uh, you know, present on a quarterly basis to you all. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about transitions of care. And I think that this is very applicable. Oh, I know this is very applicable, not only to your swing bed patient population, but to your, you know, acute patients um, or, or any real, you know, patients within your organizations that are transitioning to different levels of care or, you know, outside of the hospital. Um, I'm going to share a whole lot of different best practices um, that are not just applicable to swing bed and, and should be something that you can, you know, hopefully take and apply to um, other parts of your organization, other, you know, uh, types of patients. Um, and I'm going to, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at, you know, because, because the, the care transitions, although it's, you know, a, a, it's something that we describe. It is also something that is measured from a um, patient satisfaction HCAP survey perspective um, for your acute patients. And so we're just going to kind of talk a little bit about that um, and look at, you know, really about the, the, com the composite seven um, part of the HCAP surveys that which really deal with the transitions of care. Um, and then really walk through some, some best practices, um, related to, uh, care, care transitions. Uh, so, um, this here is looking at, again, the, the date span, um, is July, 2020 to March, 2021 for your discharges. And this is looking at the HCAP survey uh, results by the different uh, composite groups. And you can see, um, you know, I circled discharge information and care transitions. Um, for the state of Oklahoma, um, overall uh, care transition score is, is around 53%, um, uh, you know, compared to the U.S., which is about 52% overall. Care transitions tends to be the lowest score among all of the composite areas. Um, and, you know, it, and it used to be actually discharge planning or discharge information was um, on the lower end as well. But I feel like the gap between discharge information and care transitions have certainly shifted some uh, with discharge information, that composite area uh, increasing and improving uh, overall for, for many states. But I uh, just wanted to, you know, give you just a, a snapshot of the some updated survey results um, by in looking specifically at care transitions for the state relative to others. Um, and so looking at um, composite number seven, um, this is really around understanding your care when you left the hospital. Um, it has, a, um, you know, it's, it's on a, a Likert score and, and you know, the options to, um, for the, anybody that's receiving the survey to fill out, um, you know, you're indicating on strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. And then there's one question where it's a, an NA or non-applicable. Um, in the first question in this composite is around um, the staff took preference, my preferences and those of my family or caregiver into, in, into account when deciding what my health care needs would be when I left the hospital. The key word here is really around preferences. Um, so what do you think of when you think of the word preference? You know, um, certainly it's defined as a feeling or a liking or wanting one person or one thing more than another person or thing. Um, an advantage that is given to some people or things and, and not to others um, or something that is liked or wanted more than um, another thing and uh, something that is preferred. So it's, you know, when we think of preference, it's, it's it's this, you know, when we think of it, it's, we really need to be considering and appreciating certain, you know, cultural differences, any, you know, different biases that may be ingrained, 
um, that come into play when we're thinking about uh, folks and their and their preferences. Um, and so, you know, just leaving you you with that in. The second question um, that's on the HCAP score survey is, when I left the hospital, I had a good understanding um, of the things I was responsible for and in managing my health. Um, certainly the key words in this question is around understanding and responsible. Um, when we think about those um, understanding and responsible, we think about, you know, uh, creating a partnership. Um, and when we think of partnerships, it's really around clarity around expectations and clarity around responsibilities that we can, we can, it, it, you know, evolve through a, a partnership with, with our patients. Um, and, and also giving a better understanding about their position, their position when they've just had a hospital stay or time within the hospital. Again, you know, we're talking about an HGAP survey. It's it's mostly it's it is focused on your acute patients, but again, these are all you know patients that have experienced um, a hospital stay, and certainly how can that can be um, certainly disruptive. So having that un understanding, um, you know, that they're having that in increase maybe anxiety and stress, um, and what what are those feelings uh, about being in the hospital really create for them. Um, and what kind of uh, environment that puts them in. Um, and so, you know, certainly there is a, that feeling they bring forth to answering, you know, some of these questions when they get this survey. So just taking into consideration, um, certainly their, their um, kind of understanding of their healthcare needs. And then the last question in this composite is around, when I left the hospital, I clearly understood the purpose of taking my medications. Um, you know, certainly we are focusing here on understanding and realizing any like potential side effects of their medications. Um, you know, there's lots of studies and one being from the journal of chemical outcomes management that there is a high percentage of medication errors, uh, occur during the transition or times of transition. So whether that be, um, transitioning out of the hospital or transitioning within the hospital, um, at any time there, there can be a medication error and those are, you know, could be around, uh, the exchange of medication, uh, a patient with multiple providers and multiple scripts and doses, dosages, uh, polypharmacy and overuse or underuse, or even the misuse of medications, um, certainly, uh, you know, contributes to some of those medication errors. Um, so spe specifically talking about uh, care transitions here, um, care transitions and discharge information, those, you know, those two, I, I had circled on those HCAP survey results screens, there's, there's a, definitely a correlation and a relationship between them. Um, and you can see here, even just by the, the questions that are asked on the HCAP survey, there, um, you know, similarities uh, between, between the two there. Um, and I just, you know, this, this story just makes it very real on, on what, what can happen, um, during in, in it, why it's so important that we have care transitions and discharge, um, planning processes and processes. And we take in consideration, um, this, you know, as we're, you know, caring and transitioning for our patients. Um, and I'll just quickly read this, you know, a 60, 68 year old man is readmitted for heart failure only one week after being discharged following treatment for the same condition. He brought all of his pills in a bag. All of the bottles were full and not one was open. When questioned why he had not taken this medication, he began to cry, explaining that he had never learned to read and couldn't read the instructions on the bottle. I'm sure some of you have also, you know, experienced something very similar um, or, you know, to, within your organization with, with some of your patients and really just kind of hits home on the importance of, of understanding where, where people are um, before they even leave um, our, our hospital. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I'm sure you've all heard of health literacy and how, um, 
that, you know, folks with low health, health literacy, um, you know, maybe older adults or minority populations, those with low uh, socioeconomic status or the medically underserved people um, may have difficulty with uh, locating providers and services, certainly filling out complex forms. Um, I don't know if we've talked about this before in one of our webinars, but, you know, how important it is to have any of the information that you give to your patients whether it's discharge instructions or um, anything to, about managing their diseases, what le reading level is that information uh, printed out on? Um, and, you know, making sure that that's reviewed quite frequently. Um, you know, uh, folks with low uh, health literacy may have, um, you know, trouble sharing their medical history and, and with um, providers and seeking preventative health, um, certainly understanding or knowing the connection between risky and healthy behaviors um, and managing their chronic conditions, you know, even from, you know, medication adherence, understanding the medications, um, uh, understanding uh, maybe their the protocol or their, their plan of care for managing their diabetes. Um, and under, of course, understanding the directions uh, related to the medic medicine. Again, all planning into uh, the, the how, how do they understand their care or what level of, do they understand their care when they leave the hospital, as well as, um, you know, did they receive all of this information, this support before they left the hospital? Um, a study around the most common uh, complaints uh, with hospitals, um, uh, you know, shared by patients. And these, these four here that are highlighted in yellow um, really, you know, tie back to our uh, care transitions measure, you know, um, or, in, or the, the HCAPS measures uh, specifically, you know, staff not knocking on the door um, before entering the room. You know, that is a very much perceived, um, you know, sign of disrespect um, and it's to, to patients, um, not leveraging your whiteboards. Um, that's one thing that we always ask uh, uh, hospitals when we go in is, do you have whiteboards in the patient room? You know, do you have them? Do you use them? Uh, what kind of information is on those whiteboards and are they updated? Um, so often we'll go in to, to um, hospitals and see that, you know, the CNA from two shifts ago, um, his name is still on there. You know, that it's just um, making sure that those are updated um, and, and, and used appropriately. Um, also, you know, uh, having uh, notebooks or a pads of paper and pen in the in the patient uh, room to make sure that they're able to communicate, you know, in between, you know, a sh you know, when they don't have a provider or a nurse in front of them, and they can jot down some notes to make sure that they remember they have a, a space to do that. Um, lack of clear communication, so not um, getting updates or timely updates, or not incorporating the, that communication with with family members, um, or if something around the the patient uh, their condition changes. So lack of that cl clear communication, um, and then also feeling unengaged in their care, and uh, you know certainly we want it, you know we're it's their care that we're, you know, engaging them in and, and they should know about it. You know, they, um, they should feel listened to, um, and, and we should be engaged and they should be engaged in their care as well. So what does, um, transitions of care look like? And I love this image here because really, you know, certainly it's the patient's journey and it's really the movement or the handoff or handover between settings and practitioners. You know, we have a lot of um, practitioners, we have a lot of different care settings, and it's, it's the, the patient journey between all of these. Um, and it really can take on different, you know, looks. Um, you know, it could be from a, a handoff between uh, a unit in the hospital, you know, from uh, radiology to the ED. Um, it could be among, uh, you know, a shift change between nursing. It's, um, you know, across different care settings or healthcare organizations, you know, a patient gets discharged at home, home with home health, or uh, they go to a, a post-acute care facility. 
um, and, and information and, uh, transfer and the responsibilities of shifts, you know, certainly all of those play a key role in what, uh, the success of, of care transitions. And care coordination, it, we, we use, it looks like a puzzle because there's a lot of pieces. Um, and you know, when it's done right, those pieces fit together nicely. Um, and, but sometimes you have missing pieces. Uh, you all have probably puzzles at home that are missing the last corner piece or that last middle piece and, and it doesn't quite fit all together. Um, you know, we're, as we pursue care coordination and we want it to make, make it successful, we, you know, try to fit and, and build out that puzzle. Um, and there's lots of pieces that, that play a role in that. Um, and when we have coordinated care um, and, and, and what is defined as care coordination, it's the deliberate um, organization of patient care activities between two or more participants, um, and, including the patient. And it's involved in a patient's care to facilitate the appropriate delivery of healthcare services. So the right care at the right time, um, you know, really for, for that patient. Um, and, and most importantly, what why are our transitions or seamless transitions so important? Well, it's the right thing to do. And it's especially the right thing to do for our patients. Um, you know, studies have shown that seamless transitions create better outcomes. Um, they reduce unnecessary readmissions um, or unnecessary ED visits. Um, they reduce any of the risk of potential reimbursement impacts. Um, a you know, improve or maintain positive relationships with our consumers of care. And, you know, for some that are in, um, you know, alternative payment systems, um, and, you know, that, that could be a, it is a, a, an improvement area um, in, in those aspects there. Um, one study had shown that the, um, most critical um, transition, care transition, you know, setting from one setting to another is the hospital to home. And, you know, certainly whether that is, you know, your swing bed patients or your acute patients, you know, the goal for swing bed oftentimes is to get them home. It's return to that um, at home level of care. And so, you know, having, you know, is, it's, it's the most, most critical there making sure that we have, you know, uh, you know, programs and processes in place to be able to be successful in that. And, um, you know, oftentimes that when we go into hospitals, a lot of hospitals do have, um, some type of care transitions program, um, and, and others do, do not. And, and, you know, here are, we've provided really a, um, different, list of uh, some of the programs or models of care transitions um, that are out there and that are being used, um, whether they're different assessments or, um, you know, I don't know if, if others have implemented some of these um, programs. Um, if Feel free to jump in and, and tell us more about, you know, how you've implemented it and how those programs have helped support your care transitions program. Uh, I'd love to hear certainly more about that as well. Um, and you know, uh, the risk factors that um, qualify patients for care transition program. Uh, you can see here the top three. Um, certainly, the highest one being around you know hospitalization. Uh, uh, of course, you know, um, they, and any, any person that, you know, comes to the hospital, they're going to need some type of support as they transition home or to another care facility. Um, it, and, you know, the folks that might need uh, some more help may be folks with um, comorbidities or the, the high utilizers of the emergency department um, may, may certainly uh, need some uh, additional support related to care transitions. And then um, certainly there's tools that help um, aid in, you know, supporting care transitions. Um, the um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, it, 
says that, you know, Medicaid, one of the most common types of um, uh, inpatient er errors is around medication errors. Um, nearly 5% of hospital patients are affected by an adverse drug event. And 60% of those errors, as I mentioned before, could happen during uh, a time of transition. And older folks um, or folks with two or more chronic conditions, uh, you know, are, you know, at higher risk as well. And they're commonly are seeing, you know, multiple providers. And when, you know, there's not coordination between multiple providers, there's a higher risk that whether it's a medication error or a poor transition of care, um, it will, will may or may not happen. Um, and you can see here of the different, you know, uses of, um, some of the different, uh, um, tra transitions of care management tools, whether it's a discharge template, a uh, leveraging the teach back methodology, or you have a specific handoff protocol that you use, um, or, you know, medication reconciliation process, even, you know, various forms and checklists, you know, certainly uh, tools it, that help support um, transitions of care. Um, so, in, you know, and folks, again, this is survey data, so hence why there's some uh, percentage, percentages here, but um, there's other uh, available options out there for um, transitioning patients to other care sites, uh, you know, and having, so, you know, a patient uh, is discharged home, um, well, do they have, you know, a follow-up appointment in their clinic, in the clinic? Um, have they had a post-discharge follow-up phone call from the hospital? Um, you know, all the different um, ways that we can help support uh, patients to other care settings. And the National Transitions of Care Coalition um, has some also some uh, additional recommendations on how um, we can be successful in transitions of care um, around communication and leveraging the EHR um, and leveraging the EHR not only um, for, you know, accessing, you know, uh, discharge instructions and plans of care and communicating that through the EHR. There's also, you know, having a in, in incorporating a medication reconciliation approach to, that will really help with any, um, you know, potential medication errors is um, having in, in expanding the role of pharmacy um, and uh, establishing points of accountability, leveraging our case managers and uh, care coordinators, and um, certainly ha having a payment system that aligns with incentives developing uh, performance measures to enc encourage better transitions of care. So, you know, in, in performance measures, you know, internally and something that might be, you know, something that's encouraged externally as well. And then transition plans are based on multidisciplinary input. So having, you know, a team uh, aspect to care transitions is, is vital. And that leads me right to my next slide around um, care transitions is, is really a team sport. Um, it's you are, uh, you, you really need to leverage the team to make, to make it work. It's a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and, you know, oftentimes it's, it's left to the care management team or social services or, you know, um, but it needs to be more of it. It's a coordinated effort among, among team members to make it successful. And, um, you know, of course, having an engaged patient um, will also aid in that success of that care transition. Um, and, and some of the ways that we can help um, patient engagement um, is around, you know, active, active listening, um, you know, not multitasking, making eye contact, the type of tone of voice that we utilize. Um, you know, this is coming back to like, if you have nurses on the, on the line here, it's, it's, you know, it's really going back to some of the foundational nursing skills that we, we have learned, um, 
and, you know, and how we, how we communicate with our patients to really get them, um, engaged in, in doing that, you know, active listening and, um, creating that, it, you know, that trust in that relationship, um, and, you know, really start, starts with your body mechanics and how you speak and how you listen, um, to, and you'll have, you know, hopefully a involved and in, in engaged patient. Um, certainly there's an aspect to some challenges, um, related to patient engagement. Um, and, and this is just, you know, a chart of, of health conditions that, uh, present, you know, challenges related to patient engagement, uh, it, you know, behavioral health being almost 50% of that. Um, and then, you know, some of the chronic conditions around, uh, diabetes and, um, CHF, um, uh, also, also play a role in there. So let's get into some best practices. Um, this is, uh, and again, we'll, we'll have the recording, we'll have the slides. So you'll be able to, you can almost use these next slides as almost a checklist to say, Hey, you know, are we doing this or can we expand here? Um, and so we, um, you know, I want to share certainly these resources with you. And so those will, these slides will be provided, but I encourage you to maybe, you know, Hey, let's, let's see if, we're, are we doing these? Um, great. You know, have it as a, as a checklist, but really, um, you know, when we say best practice, what does that mean? Uh, it's, it's a method or technique that has been uh, consistently shown to show results, um, superior or better to those achieved with other means. And it's often used as a benchmark. Um, and so that's what we'll share, but really, you know, I it, use caution because, you know, sometimes a one size fits all model doesn't work. And, you know, what may be a best practice is not something that might work for your organization, but maybe if we tweak that best practice, it will be a best practice for your organization. Um, you know, and, you know, certainly what we, we want to do is make sure we're celebrating the successes. And, you know, when you implement best practices or you implement something new, it certainly starts small um, and, you know, build upon maybe what you already are doing um, and, and where you can, uh, you know, certainly go. Um, and then always, you know, don't let perfect get in the way of good. So um, some of the best practices around um, care transitions is, um, you know, creating a, a system. This is going to be a, a process. So maybe you have a process that's, you know, you have a discharge planning process. Well, maybe we are expanding that and really taking that care transitions also in that, that area as well. Um, and uh, create that, that, that standardized system or that process that you and it's applicable to all the patients, all the discharges, whether it's acute patients, a swing bed patient, um, and they always um, go through the sa that same process. Um, so there's that consistency, um, and that you know you have that consistency of, of of that process for even transitioning folks into different levels of care, um, in, or into different care settings as well. Um, as I said, you know, creating that multidisciplinary team, um, it's, it's a, it is a team sport and there's, um, it can, it should be starting the process should be starting on admission. So, you know, looking at ways that we can get, uh, very patient specific information that's going to support, uh, the plan of care and also the discharge plans and, um, you know, really help and, and create that foundation at, at the start. Um, you know, communication tools around whiteboards and hourly rounding um, and uh, bedside shift reports as well. Um, if we don't um, allow, you know, staff or clinicians to have uh, information uh, to share with patients, you know, access to information uh, or have their um, input in the plan of care. Um, we, it, you know, you're limiting yourself um, to ways in which that we involve the patient and the family in that plan of care and in that transition. So, it, you know, when they get that that survey, um, 
survey, you know, at their end of their stay. And there's the questions around, you know, you know, did they involve my, my patient, the patient and the family, you know, they, they, we should be building those into our daily care. Um, you know, having instilling patient and family ownership, uh, in, in care in self-care, um, you know, having that open communication that's inclusive and it's collaborative, um, discussing what long-term goals, um, that patient has, whether they're, you know, personally, they should be, you know, individualized and, and personally motivated, um, having, you know, home caregivers, uh, involved in, you know, have them supported, you know, prior to the patient leaving the hospital, um, and, and having some type of communication or reminders that are implemented as well. And, um, you know, whether or not we can, you know, partner with technology or, um, other organizations to support patients, um, after they, they leave the hospital and maybe specific patient populations, vulnerable, pop, uh, patient populations as well. Um, we talked a little bit about, um, the health literacy. So making sure that we have, um, you know, we're using healthcare terminology that's appropriate. Um, and, or, or our, you know, the things that we hand out, we share with our patients that they um, are at a, at a set reading level that is appropriate um, as well. Um, you know, having um, our nursing assessment inclusive of kind of the discharge readiness. So um, what are we, you know, do we have, you know, those uh, support services lined up? Um, do we have uh, you know, can we provide basic, you know, support tools for those patients when they're at, you know, at home, having pharmacy right involved with the medication education and reconciliation process. Um, and then, you know, certainly transportation and financial considerations and having, whether it's, um, you know, a financial consideration where we can get a, a patient um, enrolled in Medicaid. Um, and do we have, you know, financial counselors that could help, um, you know, the family and, uh, the patient, um, in, you know, in the answering any, any, uh, questions or enrolling them in some type of assisted services as well. Um, and certainly be, uh, conscientious of, of culture, of, of your, your biases and other folks, um, different cultures and their expectations, um, you know, when we're, when we're, um, planning, you know, plans of care, as well as, uh, transitioning and discharging those, those patients. Um, and, you know, here's, you know, some, you know, specific kind of process, um, you know, to, almost to do's, if you will, for, um, a, a, to improve really the transitions of care. So, you know, at your discharge planner, um, you know, when you're discussing the plan, um, you know, have, there's, there's introductions that are had, um, you know, certainly explain the process of, of, you know, discharge planning or, um, under wanting to understand what their preference are and what their needs are going to be at discharge. Um, and certainly when you're doing your, um, assessment, it's not only about their physical needs, but if they have, uh, you know, psychosocial needs or, or there's other barriers that may impact their, uh, you know, you know, social determinants of health, for instance, that may be a barrier or an impact to, uh, a, a safe and, um, a good outcome transitions of care. Um, and then, um, oh, I, I just mentioned about, you know, kind of the, any financial concerns and then, um, also, you know, understanding what level of knowledge they have related to their, their health condition or, um, you know, because that's going to aid if we have a better understanding that's going to aid in, in being able to um, support any of the gaps or the needs that they may have. Uh, education certainly is, you know, when we are transitioning that patient out of the hospital or to a different care setting, maybe they're going home on uh, a new medication. Um, and so some or something that is as different, um, have, making sure that we have, um, you know, education related to those medications, along with any of the potential side effects. Um, and, 
and maybe they're going home uh, with a new disease or, um, you know, something that we, maybe they've had an exacerbation, so they need to be re-educated on how they manage their, their disease. Um, and so certainly, um, you know, there's, there's tools like a stoplight form that would help them, uh, you know, with the signs and symptoms and when I call the, a physician um, that we can educate our patients on um, uh, as well. And then um, utilizing a readmission risk assessment. Um, I, don't, I don't know if folks are utilizing readmission risk assessment, but certainly, you know, you know, as critical access hospitals, we're not penalized on readmissions, but it's something that we should be uh, very cognizant of. We should be you know, implementing processes um, to reduce the number of readmissions because uh, oftentimes it's something that can be prevented. Um, and we, you know, we need to understand if this patient might be a, a risk for a readmission and what we can do to, to reduce that, that risk. So I don't know if folks have uh, utilized this um, care when explaining and or teaching, you know, um, so care, the C for control, A for active, R for re relevant, and E for experience. Um, so, you know, control, we, can, we appreciate controlling our situations. We wanna give patients the choice um, when and where to learn uh, new material. Um, relative to active, we learn best when we're engaged and involved. So, so really we wanna make that in education active. Uh, in interactive. So whether it's a, you know, a teach back or, um, you know, show me how to administer uh, your insulin, um, things like that when we're, we're doing our, our teaching. Um, relevant, we assume more responsibility for information that is relevant to our practical needs. So explain how this information fits into their life. You know, if the, it's a patient that is going off, um, going home and has to take, you know, uh, do nebulizer treatments, you know, every so often now, you know, how does that, how, how can we plan our day around, um, doing that? How maybe it's, you know, we need to, um, kind of shift their mindset a little bit and, and incorporate that into their, into their life, um, and experience when, you know, when we apply new materials better, we can uh, relate to our past experience. So relating education to the patient's life experience um, is, is vital. It, it really gets, it's, it's, it's very much patient-centered care when we, when we really bring some of those teachings um, and relatable to their, their life experience. Um, I mentioned teach back certainly a bunch, um, just a method of patient education um, when we're doing discharge um, instructions or uh, discharge teaching, um, utilizing a discharge packet, so um, or an admission discharge folder um, where you have all of the information um, in in a folder or or a binder. Some some hospitals use binders that has, you know, their, their um, you know, plans of care, their specific diagnosis, their medication instructions, um, you know, it also has information around the hospital, their patient rights and responsibilities, advanced directives, um, things about, you know, the menu for the cafeteria or um, what, you know, where is, what's the telephone numbers for X, Y, Z, or where the gift shop is located, you know, things specific to that. But um, having, having those, um, that information readily available and for something that the patient takes home, it's really, you know, their plan of care and that information that they just got downloaded on by a nurse doing their discharge instructions, they can take that with them and it can, you know, hopefully remind them, oh my goodness, like I didn't hear one word that nurse said um, about my, you know, plan of care or I have to follow up with my physician. Um, I can refer back to that information and it's um, readily available. Um, and then any of that patient education that goes into those, you know, discharge folders, you know, whether it's based on their diagnosis can be a, in a stoplight form, um, something that can, they can easily access. They could, you know, something that's, 
uh, maybe, you know, visual for them if they're, you know, a visual learner, um, easy to follow, and uh, certainly has information on who they can contact if they have any issues or an exacerbation or something that's more um, urgent uh, symptom or, um, you know, of their, of their diagnosis there. Um, we always recommend that pharmacy be involved in, in medication reconciliation, as well as um, patient education regarding medications, whether it's a new one. Not all you know, hospitals have that luxury of having pharmacy available all the time um, and or to be able to be part of that discharge um, you know, planning uh, committee or their that care transitions team, uh, but certainly that would be a, a recommendation there. Um, and when you're when you do have that discharge folder or that patient packet or um, the binder, whatever you might utilize, it's, it should be something that's referenced and referred to by the staff during that patient stay, so that they're familiarized with what is included um, and and what is in that that folder. Um, uh, to support them, you know, and if they have any questions, it can certainly ask those questions while they are um, in the hospital during their stay. Um, this is just a little bit of information around, you know, medication education. So um, whether it's the pharmacist that's doing this or it's a nurse doing the, the discharge instructions, um, you know, so, certainly some, some scripting um, that we can, uh, utilize here. And that we want to make sure that um, medication education and uh, reconciliation is clear and that we maybe it's tools that we have created or, um, you know, we can partner with the pharmacy for some kind of best practice um, ways in which that we can educate uh, folks and have folks be more supported in the management of their meds when they go home. And um, when we do discharge, uh, discharge a patient, um, that, that care transition team should uh, be doing follow-up phone calls. Um, we have, you know, best practices between 24 to 48 hours. Um, and certainly we want to have whatever practice you end up um, implementing that it is consistent and that, you know, you, whether you utilize a script or you, you know, document that information on that discharge follow-up phone call, um, we should be connecting with those, those patients, um, after they leave the hospital, because, you know, as you know, patients that are leaving the hospital, if they're going, um, home, you know, they're just happy to be home and they might have not heard one thing that you said, um, as it relates to their new medications, because they just wanted to go home. So we just want to make sure that we provide that check-in, that follow-up. Did they get, did they have any questions? Can they tell us what the medications are going to be taking and, and what the frequency is and what the dose is? Um, you know, and so that's really important to implement some of those discharge follow-up phone calls. Of course, we need to, um, you know, and, and maybe we, we, implement that you, you know, within this process that you also inform the patient that you may, you will be um, calling them uh, to check in. And so if they can make sure that they can confirm a good telephone number, because oftentimes that is not captured consistently or correctly up front. Um, and so having, you know, a good working phone number um, will be um, uh something that will make this, this process must much more successful. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the follow-ups calls, um, should be somebody that, uh, maybe utilizes a script or a template because we want to, um, address, or we want to collect information because maybe we have received, you know, consistent feedback that, uh, the, maybe the whole discharge process or the transitions of care process was very rushed and they did not have a chance to ask any questions. Well, we need that feedback because we need to improve our process and our, our care process um, as we you know discharge uh, patients. So collecting some of that information and, and having that documented somewhere um, is, is certainly 
um, important. And here are just some uh, of some of the, the questions that you can certainly incorporate into those discharge follow-up phone calls. Um, you know, if they've had any unexpected issues or if they're stable, did they understand their discharge instructions? Um, uh, you know, of course, the, the medication question there, did they have a follow-up appointment? Do they know when that is with their your primary care? Um, do they have any issues getting a new prescription? Um, do they have any issues around transportation or getting to their medical appointments or picking up their medication? And then if, you know, pharmacy was some, or if pharmacy, if home health was um, referred, have, has home health been and done their, um, you know, initial visit uh, and come and see the patient? And then if they have um, any questions about their chronic condition, um, if that is something that they've, they have. Um, we always like to have, you know, again, it goes back to that discharge packet that, or that folder, um, you know, utilize that as a tool, um, have them, uh, use that discharge packet when they're on the phone with you and walk them through that. You know, it should be something that's leveraged and, and utilized as, as a tool here. Um, and then, you know, um, anytime, you know, having, for those folks that might be, you know, your multiple comorbidities or chronic care patients, um, having them enrolled, or maybe if you do have a chronic care management program, um, and, and if they do qualify, maybe consider having them enroll in, in your chronic care management program um, and, and to, to aid in some of that additional care and follow up uh, to support to really care for that, maybe that, you know, patient with uh, diabetes and, and um, heart failure. Um, and lastly, you know, my last slide here, um, you know, standardizing, and I don't know if, if folks have um, uh, implemented or, or utilized the I pass the baton um, and, you know, having standardizing that care transition for the patient while they're in, in the facility or in the hospital um, and, and how we um, communicate from peer to peer on transitioning that. Um, these are certainly some of the ways that we can implement that um, through the I pass the baton um, here and exchanging some of that information there. So that's it. I feel like I just <laughs> went through those very quickly. Um, there's a lot, and um, but we will have these uh, available for you all. Um, and so, does anyone have any questions? Does anyone does anyone have a current program or process or um, in place that they'd like to maybe share? Um, what work has worked really well for them? Or is there something that um, anyone is currently struggling with as it relates to transitions of care? Is everyone's transitions of care uh, score uh, above the 53%? Above 53? Or is that something that you're working on or? It's a quiet group today. Well, with that, I don't know if we want to end wrap up a little early, Laura. Um, no, I think that'd be great. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, that was a lot of really great information. I know if anyone has any questions, um, please reach out to me. I'm happy to place you in touch with Lindsay or um, try to troubleshoot your questions. If you guys have any questions at all moving forward, please let me know. And thank you, Lindsay, for your time. Certainly. Thanks. Thanks all. Have a good rest of your day.